Good morning, folks. I'm hoping you can hear me at this point. See my screen. Can you hear me? Yeah. Can you hear us, David? I can. You can hear me okay? Uh, very well. Yeah, we're just getting the big screen set up for you. All ready to go. Yeah, you can go ahead and start. Okay, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to be here and uh, to join you remotely from Albany, where, you know, of course, all good things are happening uh, for your future. I just wanted to uh, begin by thanking um, everyone that is attending for your opportunity to uh, get together, learn some really practical uh, information this weekend. And, um, you know, to pe people like Peter, um, who are providing the boots on the ground to uh, operate cemeteries and keep them functioning for the next generation. I thank you uh, for your work. And uh, certainly, you know, we thank the Tug Hill Plateau Commission for continually to push this issue in the North Country um, as about how we practically deal with cemetery, cemetery abandonments and municipal responsibilities. I'm going to go through a short presentation and then uh, we're going to save the questions for the end and so that we can get through the basic information that will be available uh, online after this presentation as well. And uh, just to commend folks who are putting this project together, you are certainly well served by Cindy Craig and Joe Farinini, two folks that I respect greatly and who have dedicated a big chunk of their lives uh, to cemetery preservation and operation. So, again, thank you for the opportunity to be here. So. If we want to just step back a minute um, and talk about um, cemetery um, operations and the challenges that we all face, uh, they're ones that we have um, heard about uh, briefly touched on today. And for some reason, my computer is not allowing me to advance our screen. So bear with me for one second. There we go. So, uh, you know, back in 2016, not that long ago, uh, a clarion call was sounded by even the Association of Towns who said we face it in the sense of cemetery abandonment facing municipal crises. We face a crisis unimaginable um, in terms of impacts on taxpayers and the lot owners. And that's because under, as you many of you know, under state law, if a cemetery becomes abandoned, it becomes the responsibility of the municipality in which it's located. And when you look at uh, the numbers that we're going to go through in a few minutes, you'll understand uh, how significant that potential impact is in communities across New York, particularly in upstate, um, under the age of the tax cap, where there are limited opportunities uh, for revenue and uh, additional revenue. So there are approximately 6,000 cemeteries in New York. That includes every cemetery that you can think of. Um, and, you know, all the cemeteries that you would see on the road and the ones that we've talked about uh, earlier today. There are um, New York State regulated cemeteries, as we talked about earlier, and they're a fraction of that number. All cemeteries in New York are nonprofits and are and expected to be operated as such under state law. So regardless of the type of cemetery there are. But when we talk about uh, a number of cemeteries today and the fiscal responsibilities on municipalities and, and the management opportunities, we're going to be talking about uh, state regulated cemeteries. So as we heard about earlier, uh, there's a division of cemeteries. It is controlled by the New York State Cemetery Board. A designee is uh, appointed from the Department of State, the Attorney General's Office and the Department of Health. Uh, the DOS, the Department of State designee, serves as chair of the cemetery board. They they meet by law every month. Um, those uh, meetings are um, archived. Great entertainment if you want to watch them uh, later on. They are um, available so you can you watch them remotely like this webinar and be able to be updated on the rules and regulations uh, for cemetery operations and the types of projects that are being approved and the types of applications that will be submitted. So I'd encourage you to uh, pop in 
on one of those meetings, uh, you, which you can attend remotely, just so you have an opportunity to see what's going on around the state, because many times the applications that are before the board are applications that uh, are happening from small cemeteries across upstate as well as large municipal cemeteries. So last report that we have on cemetery operations um, and financial stability, unfortunately, is from the 19, late 1990s uh, by the Sloan Consulting Group. And at that time, it was determined, and I can tell you that it hasn't improved, uh, that 74% of large cemeteries in New York are underfunded. 66% of New York small cemeteries are un underfunded, and that's many of the cemeteries that we'll be talking about today that are regulated nonprofit cemeteries. Same numbers can be uh, pushed across um, any other type of cemetery, whether they be religious or otherwise, as they're all facing similar concerns. In 2011, there were 1,800 regulated cemeteries in New York. By August 2016, that number had dropped to 1,750, and that's a drop of 3% in just five years, which you can understand the alarm from the Association of Towns. I've been representing cemeteries since 1995, and I can tell you that um, it has been quite concerning in the acceleration of the abandonment issues facing, particularly upstate. One year later, more than five state regulated cemeteries would be abandoned to locality, so you can understand um, the numbers are increasing, and five is certainly too many for um, any upstate community. And by January of 2023, the number had dropped to 1,686 cemeteries, so a significant, significant drop. So since 2011, we've lost more than 6% of the regulated cemeteries to town abandonments. Uh, that's 114 cemeteries, and I can't tell you how many millions of dollars in town maintenance and operational charges for uh, spread out across the state. If any of you have had to operate a cemetery yourself, you know how difficult, as we heard about earlier, it is just to arrange for mowing and um, just general maintenance and uh, winter burials and all the other things associated with cemetery operations. So it is a fiscal time bomb for localities, and it's certainly going to get worse. And if folks would argue that um, this is not something that we need to be concerned about, let me tell. Let's go to the eastern part of the state. Uh, back in 2015, when I was asked to intervene um, in a, a expected abandonment and directed abandonment by the state uh, with a cemetery that uh, was in two towns, the towns of Plattsburgh and Ellenburg, turned out to be the largest abandonment in state history, small rural communities um, in the North Country, and the ultimate abandonment of the cemetery cost uh, was going to cost the localities approximately $2.5 million to just to get the cemetery back up in operation and to repair the conditions uh, associated with the abandonment. And it was so large that, um, well, let me give you a perspective. Ellenberg, I think, had at the time had a budget of about $600,000 a year, and this was a uh, $2.5 million abandonment. It was so bad that we had to get a spe special budget appropriation um, in the New York State budget of $2 million to help offset the cost of repair and, and uh, bringing these cemeteries up to snuff. So while we're raising the alarm on the fiscal impacts uh, to localities, I, I do want to back up and say most cemeteries in New York are very well run. And many of you are here today uh, because you care about your cemeteries and you're making a real impact locally. So we're talking about the cemeteries that are on the fringe, uh, and they are located in every portion of the state, and that's what we're going to be talking about uh, for the most part today in my presentation. So what's going on uh, and what's driving abandonment? And it's pretty practical, and I, I think we all, we're all living it. So there's a tremendous shift in markets. If you have your own finances, you, you saw the stagnation in the economy for so long, the stagnation in the markets, low returns. Many of the cemeteries without, you know, more than one or two burials a year, or uh, maybe they have one burial every couple of years, that's their income. And that income coming in is not sufficient at current uh, market conditions to keep the grounds mowed and operational. And with a declining amount of revenue from their investments, whatever type they may be and however limited they may be, it is becoming extremely difficult for them to operate. 
there's been a considerable shift in societal norms as far as um, the view of cemeteries. And that includes an economic outmigration from across upstate New York in particular. And so if you have families who are not uh, who are who are leaving the state and not coming back, there is a considerable uh, ex expectation that those uh, folks will not be buried in New York either. And perhaps their family members will follow them in their economic outmigration um, and interments will happen somewhere else or cremations might happen and those remains would be shifted out of state. So we also talked about uh, changes in the value of importance um, and religious and funeral customs. We're seeing this evolve in uh, so many ways. I think in the last 10 years, there's been an acceleration that we haven't seen in modern times and related to funerals and, and burials, where the uh, types of services and what is being done at the end of life is shifting dramatically. And that's certainly impacting the views that folks have about the importance of cemeteries in their community for uh, interment and a shift in many cases towards more of historic sites and not necessarily something that's relevant to their families um, as we move forward. And that's certainly not the case everywhere, but we are seeing that as a tremendous impact, um, certainly the more we go downstate. And I, I think the preeminent impact is really to the move to cremation. And uh, the National Funeral Directors Association has indicated that uh, the national cremation rate will hit 77.8% by 2035. Um, in parts of New York, Buffalo in particular, if we want to go out west, um, is seeing uh, one of the highest cremation rates in the state, almost at 70%. So there is, uh, with the shift of cremation, there is less of an interest in uh, in-ground interment. And uh, certainly another problem that's on the horizon is the fact that what are we going to do with all these cremated remains if people are not um, memorializing them in a cemetery as they build up in on shelves and in closets around uh, the state of New York as folks decide that they want to pursue cremation but don't think uh, really what they're going to do after the fact. So we'll be talking here briefly a little bit about town takeover backgrounds and um, the general information that's really foundational to how you're going to pursue um, dealing with your own cemetery as, a, as it's operating now and the potential uh, turnover of a cemetery to a you know, local municipality. So the guiding principles, town law, section 291, um, and there is no ambiguity in that section. Uh, town Law 291 requires municipalities, towns to take over cemeteries in their borders. So this is um, does not include private, religious, or family cemeteries as far as the doctrine of 291 related to um, general cemetery operations. And it breaks down into a few classes. We're just going to, I'm going to highlight those a little later, but that gives you the general sense. So if it's a general operational cemetery for the community, Town Law 291 says the town is taking over the cemetery. So how do I know if my cemetery is regulated by the state of New York and subject to 291? Well, that's pretty easy. So that's the easiest class of cemeteries uh, to find out um, because the uh, state Division of Cemeteries on their website, on the Department of State website, actually has a list of cemeteries, and you can look it up by county as well as by name, um, that provides a list of um, cemeteries in New York that uh, are most likely subject to turn over to the town if they are to become abandoned. Uh, now, it is not, we should be clear, it is not a comprehensive list. There are instances where we've discovered, and we'll talk about that in a moment, uh, cemeteries actually qualify uh, for abandonment to a municipality, and um, we'll go into that in a little bit. But I think one of the things that we really have to be clear about is that on some of these more technical issues related to abandonment and uh, municipal takeovers, the town's uh, attorney is going to have to be involved uh, to follow 291 to determine um, their specific responsibility. And certainly, as far as the Department of State is concerned, under new rules and regulations that we'll talk about in a moment, they are. Um, they will be intricately involved involved with the uh, process of abandonment, and there will be some clarity provided there. So, as I said, the cemetery uh, sections under two ninety one are broken down into class cemeteries, uh, classes of cemeteries. So, to be clear, 
a nonprofit regulated cemetery that's on the cemetery board list, it's in the for, it's in the first class of cemeteries. You're not going to have a choice. It is going to be a requirement that you take over the cemetery uh, in, in the event of abandonment. And um, under that scenario, um, that would be a cemetery that's been uh, titles been vested in general usage of the town for at least 14 years. And we're, when we're talking about cemeteries that have been in operation for 200 years, um, I think we meet the test on most of those cemeteries uh, in many of your communities. Um, there's going to be a requirement that uh, the municipality provide fencing to encircle the entire cemetery and that it must be mowed at least three times a year. So generally regulated for-profit entity um, or town abandonment and turnover, that makes sense. And um, it doesn't apply to family or private cemeteries. That makes sense. Uh, but wait, we have Con v. Boylan from 1962. And in this uh, particular case, which has become policy, it, it outlines that uh, if a cemetery was private or a family cemetery, but it was laid out and the lots were sold to the general public, by virtue of that act, it becomes a public cemetery and could be subject uh, to town takeover and uh, most likely would be. So town versus village and city, we keep talking about the towns, town law sections uh, 291. Um, important to note that uh, it does apply to towns. It doesn't apply to villages. Villages have the opportunity to take over a cemetery and there is specific uh, process and statute that they're allowed to do that, but a village is not required uh, to take over a, an abandoned cemetery and cities are not required to take over abandoned cemeteries. Uh, so I don't know if that uh, back in the day that uh, the villages and the cities had better lobbyists, but that seems to be uh, what the case is. And, uh, you know, in a, from a practical perspective, I've seen in many instances where villages just decline. Uh, towns first ask the village if it's the cemetery is located within a village uh, to take over management. They usually decline um, because their attorneys are advising them that it's the town responsibility. So uh, it is uh, something to keep in mind. There is no requirement, but you're allowed to do it. So can a town uh, proactively prevent abandonment? They absolutely can. And, you know, when I when we talk about abandonment, we're just generally talking about abandonment from the perspective of, OK, maybe there's a cemetery that's just sitting there and we haven't seen anyone do anything with it or we don't know anyone who's left who's involved in it. That's going to take a little bit of process. But when we're talking about general regulated cemetery abandonment, we're, we're talking about a operation where they can no longer find a board, uh, enough board members to sustain the cemetery operation. They no longer have enough funds uh, to maintain the operation or they're essentially uh, bankrupt. Um, and those, those primary factors lead to abandonment when you're going to have someone go to a municipality and say, look, we're, we're, we're just done. We have nobody left. We have no money. Uh, we have no reserves and operations to be able to operate the cemetery. So what can you do to uh, be proactive in preventing abandonment? And I can tell you this firsthand, that um, simple outreach uh, really is the best uh, operational structure for a municipality in preventing widespread abandonments within their communities. And that's the need to inventory cemeteries. And, and certainly the Historical Society is a great uh, avenue to do that, to figure out which cemeteries are public cemeteries and which ones aren't. For those really well uh, maintained and operated cemeteries, it's conversations with the volunteer board members and talk about what their needs are and uh, what they're looking to do. Ask some simple basic questions if you're a municipal official about how operations are going. One of the best um, conversation starters you can have is, um, may I see a copy of your last annual report, state annual report, uh, which is required to be filed annually. If the local municipal or local cemetery looks at you like you have four heads, uh, let me tell you, you have a problem. I just did this um, in the spring. There was an annual meeting for a local cemetery. My funeral director asked that I get involved, that there were some issues, and I attended the meeting and asked for a copy of their last annual report. And they had one, but their last annual report was filed in 2018. Um, and so we had gone several years without filing their report. And uh, it was an indicator of some internal control problems and some operational problems. And we've since stepped in to be able to uh, help them file their annual reports and get caught up and get a better handle on their operations. 
ask folks what their most significant challenges are. Excuse me. They're going to say it is uh, mowing <laughs> and operations, general operations in the summer. And those are conversations that can lead to other opportunities to be um, proactive in being able to assist local cemeteries to prevent their abandonment. One of the most effective tools that you have as a local official or a community member to recommend to your town is the new uh, municipal assistance law. So previously, uh, the controller's office, the state of New York had indicated that um, local municipalities had no statutory authority to provide assistance to cemeteries uh, to pre prevent them from being abandoned and to keep them operating. Uh, the controller's office wanted local municipalities to have that opportunity because of uh, the obvious fiscal impacts to a uh, municipality if the cemetery was become abandoned. And towns were very much interested in providing some simple uh, general assistance to help keep the cemetery operating. Uh, one of those things um, was, you know, simple bookkeeping or help with post storm where a storm may have blown trees down and the cemetery can't actually even do burials because they have no ability uh, to clear the trees out of the way. They're too expensive. Um, the municipality may be already in storm operation mode, may even have grants available um, from FEMA to do cleanup. It's nothing for them to come in and take a couple of trees down. Perhaps the apron to access the cemetery um, on the road is uh, deteriorated and it's making it difficult for visitors and making it less appealing. When the town's uh, paving the road, it doesn't cost much just to go in to um, provide a, an additional apron uh, into that cemetery. And maybe just the ability to advertise for bids uh, to do annual maintenance of the cemetery. Towns can certainly provide that assistance. So that's all um, perfectly legal now um, under the municipal assistance law. State law and, and the courts have outlined that um, cemeteries are quasi-government agencies and that they provide a specific public purpose. And um, that's important to note and why the municipal assistance law makes sense in this particular instance. It provides the opportunity for cemeteries um, to be able to uh, receive assistance from municipalities in, in a number of different ways. So one of the other uh, avenues that we have uh, for assistance, and this is uh, happening across upstate New York in the last, uh, well, since 2020, when uh, it became a, uh, there were statutory provisions passed that allowed for a specific process of mergers. Um, towns now have an option to uh, talk to cemeteries, particularly before abandonment, um, to talk about ways in which they might be able to merge with other operations. So if you have cemeteries adjacent to each other or close by, perhaps you have one cemetery that's doing remarkably well and another that's, you know, just eking by. Combining pooling their resources might be an effective option uh, for those cemeteries. And that's certainly an option within a municipality to encourage mergers um, through that process. And it's chapter 359 of 2020. And the statute is uh, provides specific details on the information you need to provide to the state, and then you can move forward with uh, a general merger uh, for consolidation, just like any business would consolidate to uh, address their challenges in the community. So cemetery abandonment prevention regulations were recently passed um, in the state that uh, provide specific direction and authority um, to the division of cemeteries on how they need to proceed when they learn about potential abandonments and uh, how to address those. Uh, this, these regulations come out of a bill that was actually passed unanimously in the legislature uh, with the work of the Association of Towns in an effort to stop abandonment post that uh, Plattsburgh story that I told you about where the largest uh, abandonment in state history happened. And it was a direction um, in, in the proposed law that uh, provided for some of these regulatory responsibilities. Uh, Governor Cuomo vetoed the bill at the time, um, and uh, but in his veto message directed the division 
and the cemetery board to come up with uh, additional regulations to assist uh, in the prevention of abandonment. So those have uh, recently been enacted and uh, they are quite helpful. So the resources to prevent abandonment, uh, there's a process for regulated cemeteries uh, that's now outlined and you know part of the review process. The Division of Cemeteries is very involved. Um, it involves uh, auditing and uh, notification requirements to local municipalities, tries to get everyone who has a, a vested interest in the success of the cemetery uh, to be involved in the process in preventing the abandonment, including looking for uh, new board members. And uh, certainly that's one way in which a municipality can help a struggling cemetery. If the difference is um, you need three board members to run the cemetery a, a corporation and they only have two and no one else is willing to do it, well, maybe it's one of the representatives from the town who winds up sitting on the board as well um, to keep a closer eye on operations and to see how the town might be helpful uh, in preventing the abandonment and keeping the operation functioning. Um, and there is uh, a, also a requirement that uh, the entire area be reviewed to seek um, additional cemeteries in the area that might be able to assume management. It doesn't have to be a complete merger, but it could be a management agreement where a cemetery might be able to uh, step in and provide some of the operational um, needs and uh, maintenance responsibilities for the cemetery. And it also provides for uh, the determination of abandonment. And I think that's uh, an important piece. Sometimes when a when the Division of Cemeteries learns about a potential abandonment, there's really no fixing the situation. That's just the reality. Um, so a cemetery might skip some of these um, processes and be declared abandoned. But that direction and, and um, authority is reviewable and you can certainly you have a notification period where a town would receive notification and they could appeal that decision with the cemetery board um, and that's that's an important aspect of this proposal so um under the new regulations there would be a formal declaration of abandonment it's technically appealable by the towns um, and there is as i stated a, a period for review and it's a 60-day comment period following um, that notification and so you might get that through the division of cemeteries or you might have just a cemetery show up and say here's uh here are the books that's all yours and uh it's you figure it out uh, at that point any kind of process instituted by the state obviously is not going to be that helpful so one of our town cemeteries is abandoned now, what do we do? Well, I get that a lot. I've, I've had to take over three cemeteries myself in my municipality. And, uh, you know, they've all been pretty similar. They've been out of one uh, had $17 in the bank and all of the board members had become permanent residents of the cemetery. Another had one board member left uh, who was about 85 years old, who was trying to mow the cemetery with a push mower and was down to the first two rows of the cemetery was all that he could do. Uh, and the other was uh, two, two board members left uh, who were no longer uh, able to maintain and operate the cemetery. So we wound up taking those over with very little notice. So if you're going to take over the cemetery, um, that's something that you're going to have to address as a community um, through your town board. And I always encourage town boards to adopt a resolution for the takeover. Um, that's incredibly important that you can you memorialize for the record when a town took over at a cemetery that was abandoned. And it creates a date specific record for application to the state cemetery board for funding that could assist the municipality in restoring the cemetery to the, um, to the point that they can provide general maintenance uh, for the cemetery. So the town's going to have to determine whether or not they have an active versus inactive cemetery operation. So active versus inactive. Active is uh, there are still outstanding deeds and burial spaces that are being sold and interments are going to have to happen. And so you're going to have to figure out um, how that's going to occur. Or do you have an inactive cemetery that you're taking over, which literally is just a maintenance responsibility akin to town parks. So that's that involves a little bit of investigation so that um, you are able to speak to um, whatever board members might still be around to find out 
how many burials might be outstanding in that particular cemetery. So there are, as I mentioned, abandonment funds. Uh, it's, one of the names is the New York State Cemetery Vandalism, Restoration, Monument Repair, and Removal and Administrative Fund. We have nice short names in New York State, um, but generally they're called abandonment funds. So there are funds available um, through an application to uh, the State Cemetery Board. That application is available online at the Department of State website uh, for uh, restoration of the grounds to the in the sense that you'll be able to operate the cemetery. It's not to make it look 100% beautiful and everything's fine. It's about general maintenance and operation of the cemetery. Can you get mowers through? Um, can you, um, you know, get in access to the cemetery, uh, general uh, cleanup issues, et cetera. Um, and in some instances, there is funding available for a limited amount of equipment um, that might be necessary, only dedicated uh to that cemetery and not a highway department's wish list as to what they'd like to do so as i mentioned the, there is a specific time period by by board policy state cemetery board policy it's a five-year limit uh, for your application from the point that the cemetery is abandoned to uh when you can apply uh for funds and five years you're sitting there thinking oh my goodness that's fine it gives us plenty of time uh, particularly in a post-COVID world, that's not the case. It's extremely difficult to get quotes these days on uh, um, on equipment. Certainly difficult for um, contractors uh, to provide fixed quotes because of um, so much work and uh, the cost of different things associated with repairs and operations. Um, it makes it very difficult. So I would encourage you to start to get your ducks in a row before you do the abandonment um, resolution and then to work uh, diligently to get an application in as soon as possible to the state if that's what you choose to do so that you can uh, make sure that you're within that five year time limit uh, for your application. So maintaining a recently abandoned cemetery, uh, as I said, town law does require specific maintenance uh, at least three times a year um, for mowing. And, um, you know, you need to provide general maintenance and operation of the cemetery. The fencing is a specific requirement for those class one cemeteries. Now, statute requires the maintenance, but it doesn't dictate who has to do the maintenance. And so we have a number of issues that I've seen in the North Country where we've had um, concerns about town boards dictating who's going to provide uh, specific maintenance and operation of the cemeteries. In many communities, um, the actual burials are conducted by third party entities who, you know, cover large areas of the state, maybe multiple counties who provide all the interments, uh, operations for interments in particular cemeteries, whether they be municipal or regularly run nonprofit cemeteries. Um, but in, there also is a combination where we see highway departments who are doing some of the work, um, outside vendors are retained to do mowing at some cemeteries. And so while the statute doesn't dictate who has to do it, the statute does dictate that it's the town's responsibility and the town needs to um, certainly oversee any of the uh, bidding as well as the direction for the maintenance. And in my community in particular, uh, we do a combination. So I have the highway department that does one cemetery and I have uh, outside vendors who, who maintain the other two. And um, I have a third party entity who provides all the interment services. If you are one of those municipalities that decides that um, your cemeteries are going to utilize your highway department or any functioning uh, department within the town to provide the interments, you need to make sure that all OSHA trench work uh, certification and safety procedures are A, being followed and B, being certified. Um, it's a really easy way to get into a lot of trouble. And uh, certainly it's a, it's something that's best left to the professionals who do this all the time to do the, um, the digging and the uh, prep work for cemeteries. They are, um, the OSHA requirements are significant and uh, it certainly is a dangerous condition. I always encourage folks, no matter what your safety protocols are for uh, cemeteries, that you never allow people to actually go into the graves. Um, that's a, that's a way that you can A, get into a lot of trouble and B, somebody can get seriously hurt. So then 
you're dealing with abandoned cemeteries. Now you've got to deal with the records and the mapping and the documentation. And, um, you know, usually in municipalities that falls to the town clerk. And I jokingly said it's their favorite job. It's really not their favorite job. It's the last thing they want to be doing with all the other things that they're doing. Um, it is incredibly difficult if you're given a uh, shoebox full of records and you have to make some sense of them and perhaps you got a map maybe you didn't um the last cemetery we took over i have a, a in my office um was delivered a eight foot sheet of butcher paper with uh pencil sketches of all the graves on it some of them filled in some of them not so there are some obviously some significant challenges uh with these records and strongly encourage folks to be able to um work with their clerks um and uh assist them in as they're as they're trying to deal with abandoned cemeteries so a part of dealing with those uh issues you're dealing with uh burial rights um some of the questions that were asked earlier um rates and charges the deeds the rules and regulations um these are all things that need to be put in place if you have an operational cemetery uh, and you know you're inheriting that one, one of the things that we always suggest is that you utilize uh the existing records if there are any on um from the previously operational cemetery and include those as part of your um your new rules and regulations your rates and charges etc um what i find frequently is that um the rates and charges for abandoned cemeteries tend not to be um market rate charges and folks feel like they have to charge as little as possible for the graves because they're serving the community well that's that's nice but you have to balance that with the fact that uh, a cemetery is not like a boys and girls club that can close their doors they are perpetual uh service and they have to be uh have enough funding to be able to operate for um many generations to come so your pricing has to be uh related to the pricing uh associated with that perpetual care and I would encourage you to um look at other cemeteries in the area and price graves accordingly uh, be very clear about who's going to have burial rights uh, and those are deeded rights to the graves um really keep track of your deeds and contact information your deeds should be um electronic so that you can maintain copies uh that is um all those things are resources that are available online certainly from the Tug Hill Plateau Commission uh my town website townofnassau.org where we provide a number of those documents uh, online really as a resource for other communities um to be able to access them and and use them as a template for their own cemeteries and their rules and regulations uh also there's a a component here that many municipalities don't touch on which I always encourage folks to do and that's to create a monument and foundation application and that is uh, some cemeteries have them many small rural cemeteries do not that are currently operating but if they're abandoned to communities they should have a monument and foundation application that's important because you need to know who's operating within your cemetery and so if you have a third party uh monument dealer who's coming in to do a monument uh, you need to make sure that they're insured. Uh, so it's really associated with um, almost like a building permit. And we, I have a copy of townandnassau.org on a, a monument uh, application. Uh, it goes to the building department. The other important piece is you want to know what's going in your cemetery. Um, so you should set specific requirements for what uh, stability of the monuments is going to look like. Um, you don't want monuments that are too thin, that are going to cause problems. Uh, you don't want them too tall uh, they're going to have maintenance issues and uh, as we've seen in other parts of the country sometimes people decide that they want to put things on monuments that would absolutely horrify your other lot owners it's a good way to be able to check to see what's going into your cemetery ahead of time and make sure that the requirements of the monument are keeping in um are, are generally in conformity with what's already there um and that there's no um issues associated with those monuments that you get a heads up beforehand uh, there's the ability to have the monument and foundation application is important because not only do you get a proof of insurance but you also have the first look at uh, what might be in in your cemetery one of the things I didn't touch on which I think is extremely important at the beginning if you have enough time when you're facing cemetery abandonment 
in your community, please be sure uh, to encourage your town board to have a to have a workshop or a community meeting to talk about the challenges for a particular cemetery. That might be an opportunity where you are able to bring in people who are willing to serve on the board, um, who are willing to assist the cemetery and prevent its abandonment overall. It's really community communication. I, I think what was said earlier this morning that people really care about the cemeteries in their community. And sometimes they just need a little push uh, to know that they're going to be um, the resolution to prevent abandonment and that they can participate uh, as part of the process. So I also want to talk about a couple of zoning issues and to make folks aware of some of the issues of, around cemetery operations, uh, particularly with some recent changes in, in state statute. Um, generally, you know, many of the communities that we're talking to today are, are communities that uh, have older cemeteries that are uh, previously existing non-conforming uses, um, that they're certainly uh, not the average property usage in a community. They tend to be in more rural areas. Um, they have specific challenges associated with setbacks and, and that sort of thing. Always keeping that in mind that you're not looking at a cemetery usually as a housing development. So the the use of the space is important as a pre-existing non-conforming use in quasi-public uh, benefit operation. Um, they have specific requirements governed by the state of New York. Uh, for burials and approvals with the state cemetery board um, so they need to be you need to make sure that you're partnering with local cemeteries uh, to help them with their operations and to prevent their abandonment but there are some other factors that you may be dealing with one of them is uh crematories are cemeteries i think that frequently folks don't realize that that if there's just a crematory it's just a crematory under state statute crematories are cemeteries and um, that's important to note because a cemetery may come to you uh, for an application to install a crematory. And that uh, approval is a couple steps. One, it involves approval by the local municipality. That's true from um, specific requirements on setbacks, et cetera. Also requires approval by the state cemetery board uh, who has to uh, authorize the construction based on uh, the ability of the cemetery to operate the crematory and the uh, financial stability of the operation and, and what it looks like going forward to be able to pay for that operation. There is more of a need these days for crematories in New York post pandemic, as we saw that there was a tremendous um, problem downstate where there's just not enough capacity uh, for cremation, particularly in a pandemic and, you know, I hope we never have to be in that situation again, but it, it showed the vulnerability of our system and that uh, as the cremation rate accelerates rapidly, uh, there's less and less ability for uh, cemeteries to meet that need unless they start to build crematories. And so expect in your municipalities, you know, the probability that a cemetery or cemeteries uh, might come forward for an application for a crematory. Just keep in mind that those crematories are governed on the state and the local level. Backyard burials, uh, another issue that municipalities deal with all the time in zoning, um, contrary to public uh, perception, it is a local issue. Um, the ability to bury in your backyard or on your property is a local zoning issue. Many municipalities have no um, guidelines for this. And I hear from folks in the North Country, uh, in Central New York, all the time about uh, somebody buried somebody on their property. And we have the illusion that because the family farm's been in the family for 120 years, that it's always going to be in the family. Um, and that only is not the case. And there are long-term consequences to doing those uh, backyard burials. And part of that relates to access. And the other parts relate to access, and they relate to access. And municipalities have a frequent problem in dealing with access issues later on. And that is a property is sold. If you have a municipality that has no zoning requirements um, for backyard burials, keep in mind that if you sell the property and someone's remains are on that property, you have no right to cross someone else's property line to go mourn um, at the gravesite of someone uh, that used to be on your property. 
I had an issue uh, in the in the North Country a couple of years ago where folks were having a barbecue in their backyard and the police were called because some woman was crying with flowers in their backyard while they were having their barbecue. Um, and it turned out it was an air, it was a, a relative of the person who had been buried on their property. And those are practical issues uh, that you have to deal with. So if you're looking at general zoning issues related to cemeteries moving forward, I always obviously support uh, burial within a cemetery because that helps to support the cemetery operation and uh, ensures long-term preservation of the gravesite. If you're going to allow backyard burials, you shouldn't be allowing backyard burials in municipalities without access. And that means an easement uh, to be able to get to that property, uh, perhaps some uh, fencing or um, carving off a section of the property for a family or private cemetery. That's important because long-term access is going to be important. If the municipality is ever in a position where, um, for instance, under Con v. Boylan, where um, someone has decided to start selling graves to their friends, it's a public cemetery requiring town maintenance, how are you going to access the property if, you're going to, if you need to, your highway department needs to go across uh, someone's field or um, through their property in order to get to this one location that doesn't have a right of way and doesn't have a roadway or access? So last year, the um, state cemetery statutes were also amended uh, to allow greater revenue return for cemeteries. Um, this is more of an interest in Western New York and downstate, but the leasing of cemetery lands uh, now have specific requirements and certainly have uh, local impacts. And one of the things that the legislature looked at were these larger cemeteries not small rural cemeteries, but large cemeteries say they have 400 acres. They're only currently operating on 50 and they have hundreds of years more uh, left for operations. And um, they're making no money off of the off of those uh, cemetery grounds. One of the way, things that cemeteries can do going forward is to provide a lease of those lands for some other kind of operation consistent with the cemetery. Um, lot owners and so that if it's for far enough away um, there's additional screening that sort of thing that there can be a long-term lease of that property for through another access or or another area um, that's been viewed as from anything from farming to uh, commercial operations that have a lease that terminates it's a um, good way to bring in cemetery income to prevent abandonment of the cemeteries uh, it's also a great way to temporarily uh, put some nonprofit lands back on, back on the tax rolls to utilize um, additional tax revenue for the locality, um, but encourage folks if they proceed with that sort of option and zoning is changed, that it has an immediate fallback position that the primary purpose of that property is for burial of human remains and that it would revert to cemetery use so it would go off the tax rolls at the conclusion of the lease. Um, this uh, important provision within this statute is that the lease has to provide for the removal of any structures or any any type of materials from the property at the conclusion of the lease so that the grounds can be returned to burial. Um, and again, it's just a temporary lease of property uh, for another purpose. Standalone columbarium and mausoleum prohibitions. This is something that almost no municipality uh, is aware of and other than the ones that have faced uh, this issue, but uh, there's a photo there of a, of a standalone columbarium. Um, religious organizations and, and, and uh, you know, fraternal organizations have, you know, put up these private um, installations of columbariums around the state. Local municipalities should know that they are not permitted uh, anymore in New York as of 2018 including religious cemeteries, um, unless you have a agreement in, based on the statute um, with a nonprofit regulated cemetery. And the, the reason is it comes out of that case we had talked about in Plattsburgh in 2015, where there were standalone mausoleums. And then what do you do um, if that's the only thing on the property and there's complete default and um, destruction of the buildings, you have to have a way to, to move the remains. So under this new law, uh, those columbariums can be located within the state, 
the municipality has to be uh, sure that they are providing for um, a contract where those remains can be interred in a nonprofit cemetery in case of abandonment. And that's a way of continual perpetual care of that cemetery, and um, which is a columbary or mausoleum essentially becomes the cemetery at that time. So natural organic reduction, you may have seen it in the news. Um, it's now uh, law. It'll The new regulations will be available this summer. We expect a number of applications that are going to be coming forward to uh, locate natural organic reduction facilities. Um, there are cemeteries are only allowed to operate these facilities. This may be a new way for, excuse me, um, for aging cemeteries to provide a new service. And this is generally a uh, operation that'll happen within a building, but is permitted at a cemetery uh, in New York. So that is an issue that you may see having to be addressed locally in your zoning as a new type of cemetery operation, much like crematories. Also, you're hearing a lot these days about memorial forests. Cemeteries are interested in taking a portion of their undeveloped lands and utilizing them for the disposition of cremains or natural organic reduction uh, materials as part of a memorialization within a cemetery. So that I expect, well, it's not going to start until the summer of 2023, is going to be a new issue that local municipalities are going to be facing as more and more people are becoming interested in being able to provide these services. So that's a general overview um, of municipal responsibilities. And I want to provide some time that we can answer some questions or um, opportunities for inquiries on cemetery operations and abandonment. And I'd be happy to do that now if that works for folks and uh, look for direction on how you want to proceed on that in that regard. All right, thank you, David. Can you hear us? I can. Okay, I will be um, repeating any questions in case the mic does not pick it up very well. Okay. Any questions for David? There's a question in the chat about can we talk about Perpetual care fund. Um, there's a question in the chat. Can you talk about the perpetual care fund? Uh, on a specific question or just generally what a perpetual care fund is? It seems like a broad question. Yeah. So um, there was an earlier question on perpetual care. And I, that's that was really it's something that um, small cemeteries struggle with all the time, particularly because. In many instances, there are records that don't exist, and you're trying to figure out um, how to, you know, put this all back together. But it's important to note that um, perpetual care funds are trust funds in New York, and so they are, as trust funds, you're only supposed to be utilizing the return on those funds for the operation of uh, maintenance on those specific graves. So what we see is that folks say well i just have perpetual care and the whole cemetery is perpetual care that's that's not what perpetual care is perpetual care is actually specific to a particular um grave and so that would be a specific bequest uh associated with um those those graves if there is a perpetual care fund that can be determined uh based on gifts so i have frequently see that there's only like maybe two or three gifts that were given to a cemetery, but they were large dollar amounts. They have specific requirements within those trusts that designate how that money is used. So generally perpetual care funds are not generally, they are in violet. So you can't use the principal um, for anything without a court order and cemetery board, state cemetery board approval. So you shouldn't be um, utilizing those funds for anything other than uh, the perpetual care of the specific lots. You can provide some general maintenance um, associated with the care of those lots that may extend beyond just those lots, but it is um, generally just for the operation of the cemetery. So you have a perpetual care fund and you have a permanent maintenance fund. And the perpetual care fund or the permanent maintenance fund is the general 
operational fund that should be around once the cemetery is uh, stopped operations and you no longer have the um, the income from interments to run the cemetery. Okay. So, gentlemen, move on the chat to say that I worked with the county taking care of and identifying again cemeteries. I have no record of these were formally abandoned. Both of these have been in What would be the requirement? Actually, from the county or us at some point, family or religious. If you didn't catch that, um, there's a question from Lou. Uh, Hey, David, I, take, I work for the town taking care of abandoned cemeteries. I have no record if these were formally abandoned, and most of these haven't had burials since the 1700s. What would be the required maintenance on our behalf, especially since many were at one point family or religious cemeteries? In the first part, I didn't hear. They're, they're what abandoned cemeteries? Um, they take care of and identify abandoned cemeteries, and mm -hmm. they're lacking records about formal abandonment. Right. So the abandonment to a municipality matters as far as whether or not the, the town has responsibility for maintenance and operation. If the town has an assumed uh, responsibility um, by actually providing any of the maintenance, then they're, they're currently not responsible unless there's someone who's uh, pushing forward with uh, that requirement. So if it's just a general community organization that wants to provide assistance, um, there is no specific requirements for your maintenance and operation, particularly if they're family or private cemeteries. I'm not sure if that answers the question. If there's something more specific, I'd be happy to address that. Can you hear me? Yes. Just a quick question. You spoke a lot about abandonment of cemeteries that were nonprofit state regulated cemeteries. Here in Lewis County, we have a number of old cemeteries most are not active in any way um, that are, or you could make a good argument, were public cemeteries. You can tell by the, the, the stones that are there and, and they operated for more than 14 years and, and all of that. Some towns have taken over. I'm not sure how that they know how they took them over, but they're formally on a tax map is shown to be the responsibility of the town. But there are several around that are on private property, some that the towns actually mow. But how does the town go about, if it is, taking over as abandoned those kinds of cemeteries? More and more with some of them, we see people driving snowmobiles or, or ATVs through them and damaging stones, uh, stones. Does the town have an obligation to take that over? Can it take that over? A process for doing it. Really good question. So um, to back up to one of your comments, once the town provides maintenance, they're essentially admitting that they have responsibility for that cemetery. And by simply by providing that maintenance, they've assumed responsibility for an abandoned cemetery. The challenges that I talked about earlier today are significant from a legal perspective and involve the town's attorney because if you're talking about a private cemetery on somebody else's property, um, how is the town getting there? Um, how are you, are you now trespassing across someone else's property to provide this maintenance? And if you have issues where the town wants to be involved and the property owner is okay with that, now is the time to get an easement um, in place. It's very simple to do, um, to be able to provide access and maintenance to those cemeteries. Towns are not required to take over family and private cemeteries. There are specific instances uh, where that might be the case. And just because there are a number of family names on a, in a particular cemetery doesn't mean um, that, th that it was a public cemetery. It may just mean that there are multiple generations. If I go back to my family, um, just a couple of generations, there, there were 11 siblings on one side. So you can imagine how many family members I have <laughs> with different names. So um, there is the, uh, obviously there is a situation where Towns want to take over some of these abandoned cemeteries, and I, and I see that frequently across the state. But as I said earlier, it's about access, access, access. Uh, towns can get in a lot of trouble if they start uh, trespassing and damaging property in order to get to a private cemetery, particularly if they're removing trees and that sort of thing. Um, when a cemetery is not carved out 
um, within the within the parcel. So if there's no deeded property that is actually the cemetery, it's it's all just part of the existing parcel. If I could just ask a follow up to, to that, we do have some cemeteries here in the county that I think maybe it's a historical showing you'd have to make that in fact it was public over a period of time, but the but the property owner says no no this is my property. It may just sit there that way, or the town may have actually, you know, gone in and maintained them because they have access to it. But the property owner says, no, this is my property. I don't have to turn this over to the town. What happens in that situation? Well, you get a good lawyer and go to court. I think that's um, the reality is that they have a pretty good case. If the, If it is not carved out in their deed and it's it's not carved out through any sort of real property um operation or or agreement then it's part of the property uh, and you'd have to make a legitimate argument under convy boylan or some other um statute that the property is in fact a separate public cemetery uh, i have one in my community it's at a crossroads i get a lot of calls from folks to tell me i have to go in and and clean it up and i i love cemeteries i would i'd love to do that but it's on a farm where it's not deeded uh separately and there's nothing i can do about it i can't send in my town crews to go across somebody's property who doesn't want me to do that um to maintain that cemetery it's not first of all in that case it's not a public cemetery it's a private cemetery all right there's another question in the chat from richard uh, any regulations governing gravestone rubbings um, no, but it goes by cemetery rules and regulations locally, um, based on, you know, what a particular cemetery would allow. I'm not going to speak for Joe, but he'll probably say absolutely not. <laughs> there are many other ways that you can uh, record what's on there without damaging the stone, particularly historic markers. Um, and um, I'll leave that to Joe to talk about later on. There is another question. Is it possible for an association to take over a previously abandoned cemetery that the town is currently caring for? Um, does that tie in with some of the previous questions that were asked, do you think? Yes, absolutely, you can. And I, I get contacted by towns all the time who want to get rid of the cemeteries that they're operating. Um, you know, my position is that a cemetery is best run by a cemetery. And um, really, cemetery operations for a municipality, particularly upstate, uh, where there are such limited resources is a real drag on the municipality from operations and revenue perspective. And there are cemeteries within communities that are solvent and structurally sound and have the financial wherewithal uh, to do that. And I've seen that um, there are several cemeteries. There's, there was actually, I can't remember how many mergers within the last few years since the merger bill was passed where um, cemeteries are on the edge or merging um to be able to continue operations but a town can certainly do that they can they can enter into an agreement and turn over the property uh to a functioning nonprofit cemetery okay um another question if a municipality's mowers are responsible for breaking or toppling a monument are they not responsible for its repair what can be done to force them to repair it Okay, so it depends. <laughs> so uh, one of the questions asked earlier is who's the, mon you know, what is the monument um, as far as property, who owns it, who's responsible for it? Uh, the monument is the, uh, pr the ownership of the monument is the family that erected the monument and the lot owner. So um, if a municipality is providing the maintenance and the municipality is damaging them, the monuments, then they should be fixing the monuments. Again, it gets back to what I was talking about earlier. If you have third party operations within your abandoned cemeteries or within your own cemeteries that are currently functioning well, you need to have proof of insurance and need to be named on their certificate of insurance in case there's damage on the property. There are plenty of other things that can happen. Stones can fall over um, and hurt someone. Uh, you could have, I had one mower who came through during a really, after a really bad rainstorm where a, a casket had collapsed an old grave, um, but the ground hadn't. So as he was walking over, he sank up past his knee and uh, left the mower running and never came back. Uh, so there are those issues that you have to deal with. So there are, there are perspective uh, that you have to, there's a perspective you have to have that there is liability associated with general maintenance and operation. Make sure that your cemetery 
uh, your cemeteries are disclosed to your insurance carrier so that they know that uh, you have those maintenance responsibilities. Okay. Was there a question in there? Okay, so the question is about, does the town have to have liability insurance when it comes to those sorts of things? Yes, they should have they should have a disclosure on their insurance uh, for their annual review. Uh, they and most of them now do. I just filled out my disclosures at the beginning of the year. Do you have any cemeteries uh, that you're responsible for, and if so, how many acres or how many cemeteries? Why? Uh, why the fence? As a follow up question. Why the fence? Yeah. Um, it's just the uh, the statute requires uh, that the fencing be in place. But why? Do do we know why? Uh, yes, we just talked about it. It's you can have people running through livestock, um, that sort of thing, where you have uh, situations where um, people are damaging stones, that sort of thing. The expectation was that you would you would eliminate trespassers as well as um, you know damage to the cemetery. And um, the question is about uh, state annual financial reports. Is that required by the towns? Was that your question, ma'am? Okay. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, one I should have addressed that once the town takes over the maintenance and operation of the cemetery, the state is out of the picture, other than any application associated with um, the um, abandoned cemetery application. And that's because um, the town's ultimately responsible for the fiscal operations of the cemetery. The annual report is a way for the state cemetery board and division to review the finances and operation of the cemetery. Excuse me, that might be, um, there are other factors where the state could be involved. That's if you have a crematory on the property, that sort of thing. And I do have a couple of questions in the chat about the Amish. Um, we have a new Amish community in our municipality. It would be under local zoning. Would it be considered a private cemetery? They have asked about having a cemetery on one of their properties. And a follow-up question is, yeah, about the Amish having it, what is the steps they have to take to have a private cemetery? If they're not determining that they're going to have a religious, um, if it's not religious, it's just a community and not, a, not based on the religious uh, sect that they're following, um, then they're going to be a public regulated cemetery. If um, the town should have specific zoning requirements for cemeteries, and I would encourage you um, to do that as part of your review process. You can't just establish a cemetery if you have zoning regulations in place. In many instances, the problems are associated with the fact that municipalities don't have zoning in place for cemeteries and how to provide access that sort of thing. So those are important factors um, to address. And um, you certainly have other options within the zoning law and your zoning attorney can talk to you about um, potential uh, timeouts on some zoning um, changes so that you can um, get a handle on regulations and how you want to proceed. It's extremely important that um, the local zoning address cemetery development and access and that frequently it isn't happening upstate it hasn't happened for 200 years it needs to happen just a follow-up question about that we do have a number of of amish and mennonite cemeteries in this area i think i would think of them as a religious cemetery that's that's the only folks that get buried there if there's been no provision for that do the towns need to go back and sort of retroactively amend zoning to to grandfather them in or i mean we've got a lot of these cemeteries around here right so there there would be a pre-existing uh non-conforming use if you were to change the zoning law now so they were grant they'd be grandfathered in um but there's nothing to stop you from talking about access and um providing future access. Again, I, you know, it's, it's a determination as to whether or not it's a religious operation or it's a public cemetery. If it's a public cemetery, uh, there are specific requirements for public cemeteries. And there's one last question in the chat uh, so far. On a backyard burial, is there any responsibility by the town to that grave if there is nothing in the zoning code? 
No, so it's a private burial. Um, so it, unless they start selling lots uh, to the general public, and that's part of my uh, concern that I was trying to express earlier today, um, and that it, it doesn't serve anyone to, to have a single burial in, on a property um, in modern times when you have cemeteries that have plenty of space uh, to do that. It resolves all the issues associated with access, et cetera. And the town doesn't have a responsibility for, to, to attend one grave. And, uh, you know, just be aware of that. It's If someone chooses to do this, you have no zoning. Um, they're cho choosing to do this on their own. And, uh, you know, there's there's no state protection for that. Did I understand you to say with respect to like Amish and Mennonite cemeteries that if they're not a religious cemetery, they are a public cemetery? Does that mean they need to have a nonprofit cemetery association and be subject to the regulation of the state division of cemeteries? No, uh, there are specific requirements and statute as to what a religious organization is and what uh, burial requirements, that sort of thing. If they are religious, um, if they're holding themselves out as a place of burial for the public, they do have to have, um, they do have to create a cemetery corporation. Um, but most of the instances that I've experienced upstate when you have uh, particular Mennonite communities that are Mennonite communities associated with a, um, with a religious sect, so they are a religious cemetery. Yes. Yeah, it gets back to the fact that, um, you know, you need to be proactive in addressing these issues in your community on what a cemetery is in your local zoning. There's another question from the room. Do you have any uh, templates or resources to help make the towns make a zoning law regarding this? Um, we can we can certainly if someone wants to reach out at, uh, through this event, we're happy to provide some information, folks. Absolutely. Thank you. Anything else from the room? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, someone asked, uh, their town doesn't seem to have any deeds, so similar to what Peter was talking about, just a lack of documentation. Is there anywhere that uh, they might be able to look if they are lacking these papers? Man, I wish there was a really good answer <laughs> for that, but um, I deal with it all the time, and really you have to prove, you have to prove some sort of airship. Um, the family could do it, could do a... Um, affidavit of airship to prove that there might they might have ownership in some of these graves but in most instances that you know if if you have a situation where these local nonprofits are handing off records from one generation to another um, documents get lost and for most cemeteries in new york and and i will just provide that broad term for most cemeteries in new york old deeds don't exist they may have deed books they might have index cards um, but really the goal is going forward that you provide as much information as possible. Um, you can certainly put in, um, you know, in the age of social media, you can put notice out on social media, anyone with, um, ownership and, a, you know, known ownership in a particular grave, uh, please contact us and collect that information. But for the most part, the families were given these deeds and the records were rather limited on the cemetery side. So unless a, a family can produce a deed, it's extremely difficult to know who the actual lot owners are other than the ones that are in modern times uh, that can prove, prove some sort of airship uh, to the grave. Well, I'd like to Okay, I think the, the concern with some of these cemeteries as a follow-up question is they were donated by a farming family. Um, was it, is there any sort of formal paperwork that would have had to have been done or in this, or is there just sometimes just like a handshake agreement in which case there is no documentation? What's your experience with those sorts of situations? Where a family just donated a burial space for the public? Yes. yes. Um, my experience is that frequently there are um, 
really no real property documents, so few deeds. Um, any agreements are generally lost, but once the town assumes maintenance and operation of those cemeteries, or if it's in general use as a cemetery, it's 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 a cemetery. So it's a public cemetery, and and you know frequently those documents just don't exist, and that's that's not uncommon. Um, and there are ways to address that going forward um, by creating an actual cemetery corporation, or if um, you can prove the operational um, nature of the cemetery was public, um, turning it over to the local municipality. Thank you. Any other questions from the room? If anyone has one, feel free to ask. Okay, David, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. This has been very